it raining there? No, not raining, but uh, what are we going to start? Labrīt, godāties skatītāji, mans vērts ir Zāni, un es esmu Sebbanks inovācija centra vadītāji. Man ir liels prieks, ka par spīti pasaulē valdošajai situācijai uzņēmēji vēlmi augt neviens nav atcēles. Tieši tāpēc mēs ar jums tiekamies jau piektajā izaugsmas programmas ciklā, šoreiz virtuāli. Ar 14 programmā izvēlētajiem dalībniekiem jau esam paguvuši virtuāli satikties un turpināsim to darīt turpmākos četrus mēnešus. Ar jums, skatītāji, mēs tiksimies sešās izaugsmas programmas publiskajās lekcijās, kuras tiks translēts tiešraidē. Lai uzzinātu vairāk par visiem lekciju datumiem, aicinām jūs apmeklēt seb mājas lapu www.seb.lv slīps vītra izaugsmas programma vai arī sekot šeit pat Facebook seb Latvija kontā. Šodien, kā jau tradicionāli ierasts, izaugsmas programmas sākumā mēs runāsim par izaugsmi, to vai izaugsmi ir vienmēr tur, kur to meklē un kā pamanīt jaunas izaugsmas iespējas esošajā tirgu. Šodien mums virtuāli ir pieslēdzies un lekcija vadīs pieredzējas startautiskā biznesa stratēģis un profesionāls jaunuzņēmuma koučs Wallis Screens. Wallis, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Zane, and good morning, everyone. I'm now going to share my screen with you so we can talk about how to dream bigger. Zane, can you see my screen? Do you see it? Zane? I hope you can see it because I don't have any feedback uh, if it's visible. Just a moment. I'm going to ask if you can see my screen. Yes, it's good. Okay. I just got notification via WhatsApp that you can see my screen. Labrit Latvia. It's wonderful to be with you today. Um, I miss you. I was uh, in, in Riga in, uh, the, on the 12th of March, and I flew home to my home here in Prague, and it's the last place that I had a business visit to, and I look very much forward to coming back and seeing all of my uh, wonderful friends and community in Riga. So today, I would like to uh, spend some time with you to talk about how to dream big, bigger, because um, we live in a time where starting a business and growing a business has never been easier. Uh, the availability of capital, whether it's a bank loan or it's uh, money coming from the investment community, uh, building digital solutions to engage customers in new and unique ways is much easier and uh you know, you can you can find kids in university who can build amazing stuff. They're just waiting for somebody to come along with a great idea. So today, let's uh, let's jump right in. Now, Zani did give an overview, uh, an intro uh, of me, but I, I didn't quite catch all of it. But I'm a startup coach, and this is what I do for a professional living for the last five years. Um, I wasn't always in the startup scene. I was an engineer for uh, for quite a while back in the U.S., in the, my home state of Tennessee. But I always aspired to live a, a dream life and uh, do amazing things. And so I moved to Europe 20 years ago. And uh, I studied for an MBA at the Wirtschaftsuniversität Wien. And it was, it was while I was there, I was in a class in the year 2000, spring of 2000, and studying a topic called, at the time, e-commerce, if you can imagine that. What, a, what a, a crazy title for a course. But 20 years ago, e-commerce was a brand new thing. And as an engineer, I had very low understanding, to be honest, of the business world. And I thought marketing was all about fluff and trying to get people to buy stuff they didn't need. But uh, there was a class uh, in my e-commerce class, a moment where um, my professor was explaining business models. And for me personally, it was like the light bulb went off in my head and I saw that technology plus business models means infinite possibilities. In that classroom, spring of 20, uh, 2000 in Vienna, I raised my hand, professor called on me, I stood up and I said, bright eyed, does this mean that if I'm in my car and I'm driving down the road 
and I see a digital billboard and the billboard is connected to my car and it knows who I am. Can it change the advertisement to me? He stopped and he stared at me and he said, Mr. Green, you're going to make a billion dollars. Well, I haven't, um, but I've done okay. But from that moment on, I saw the light that digital enabled so many things and that everything is possible. So I did uh, work in uh, for a startup. We, we had a soft exit in 2002. I learned everything start to finish about fundraising, building up a company, building software. Um, really, I had a two-year uh, second MBA in how to build companies. And then I went into a longer career in strategy. I worked for telcos. I worked for BTE in 2007. We did a turnaround with BTE, so that was my first experience in Latvia. But five years ago, I left because I wanted to get back and I wanted to work with people who make innovation happen. And what I love about what I do is my job is to inspire, to, to build up the confidence, the focus, to uh, aim the ambition and make people uh, excited about changing the world. And I do this with a lot of clients, especially in the Baltics region. Now, over the years uh, in my work to help startups from idea to fundraising, I've come up with my own value proposition or concept. I call it pitch like a rock star. It's three things. Uh, helping teams to have a rock solid story, to gain attention in marketplaces, to wake up new customers, to get investors interested in your, in your growth story. Number two, helping teams make their business models watertight. The last thing you want to do is spend money on technology and push it out to market and uh, the assumptions in your business model sink your ship. So we have to work those assumptions and those risks out of the business model to make it watertight. And lastly is working hands-on with the founders to make them what I call bulletproof. That means they are ready to answer questions that are short, sharp, and smart about everything to do with making their business succeed. Now there is a process that I work with in my, in my engagements and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a step-by-step -step from idea to investment. Always starts with nailing the positioning. And positioning is how you position your value proposition towards your target market, solving a problem. Too many teams build a solution and then they start chasing a problem. It's much better to so find a problem and solve it with technology. And we do that in the first step by nailing the positioning. In the second step, we need to identify what are the critical assumptions we're making about moving into this new business domain and try and mitigate those risks as much as possible. Testing and validation of an idea is another way of eliminating or, or mitigating some of the risks about your idea before you make investments and go to market. Then the fun part is when I work with teams to craft a story because Stories are how people uh, remember what you do and share your story down the line. And that's what will help you in the long run is having a great story. Then, of course, in our game, we have to go to PowerPoint. We have to build the story in slides. And there's an art to this as well. And then if teams are doing well, they get to have their moments on stage like at Tech Chill, February of this year. Um, I saw some of my teams on the big stage pitching on stage with all the techniques for engaging your audience. Those six steps helps teams help teams get from idea to investment. Now, naturally, the majority of my work is with startup companies. And there is a mentality, there's a culture, there's a way of working um, in the startup community or the ecosystem where there is a belief that everything is possible. Um, these teams are starting with nothing. That means they have nothing to lose. They have no customers to satisfy. So it's a completely different ballgame for startups versus small businesses. But what I find fascinating about small businesses is every small business once upon a time was a startup. That means that the folks, the people who started up that company, maybe there was no terminology called an entrepreneur 20 years ago or a startup ecosystem to support you or programs like uh, Seb is providing. Um, 
But once upon a time, founders were starting up a business. So they understand that you take risks, you have a gut feeling, and uh, you go with it. You place, you, you know, you place your own capital, maybe capital from the bank, and you start up that business. And then your priorities shift. Um, those priorities shift from changing the world to satisfying customers, to fulfilling orders, to taking care of your employees. And um, what I think is beautiful about small businesses is the value that they bring to society. And uh, what I hope to achieve in this program is to take a little bit of the DNA from the startup world, which still exists in those founders of small businesses, and reignite it in the same way that my professor reignited me in 2000 when I was in my MBA course. Now, of course, I'm also not a young fella. I look young, but I'm actually 52. Um, and in the late 70s and early early through, through to the 80s, a kid growing up in a little town of 29,000 people, Maryville, Tennessee, where I grew up, I saw my colleagues, my schoolmates, parents build small businesses, and I saw them grow those businesses. So in 30 years of business and 50 years of life, I have just watched companies grow and, and achieve, and today I'm going to share some of those stories with you. Now, in my professional career after MBA, as a strategy consultant, my core uh, area was innovation, and I worked for large companies. And of course, there are some meta topics which all the big companies are chasing to find new growth, new areas uh, for business growth. Now, I want to share some of these just so we get a feel for how any business grows, and then I'll go into some more specific stories. For 15, 20 years, We've been, re we've been uh, entertaining topics like customer experience transformation. In fact, I spent probably 10 years of my career specifically focusing on customer experience transformation projects with large companies. Of course, we know new product development, uh, uh, the, the uh, drug industry, the pharmaceutical companies are constantly you know, pumping R&D money back into the pipeline to try and build blockbuster products. But on a smaller scale, innovative companies are constantly innovating products to keep the revenues growing, add new value to new segments, and keep the employees working and the company growing. Digital transformation is happening at all levels of the business. I remember 20 years ago when I finished my MBA, going back to Tennessee and having a conversation with my dad in the kitchen about how his law firm needed to have a website. And he said, no, son, Lawyers are professionals. We uh, get referrals. We don't need websites. Well, it didn't take but uh, about two years before they did actually have a website, and that was the beginning of their digital transformation. So we know that these topics um, are, are happening, and they're starting to happen at every level of small, medium, and even the, the, the biggest companies. And, of course, reinventing business model is what the startups are good at. And uh, we all know the story, probably, of uh, Netflix. Once upon a time, there was a thing called a DVD. And there was a machine you had in your home. It connected to your television. And Netflix uh, thought it was a great idea to have a mail-in service so you could order your DVDs, receive them by post, and return them to a physical retail store. Now, they evolved that business model, obviously, into what they are today, which is a company that does digital streaming and uh, they have their own media arm and they're producing content. So that's been a great growth story. Some companies uh, reinvent their brands by reconnecting with customers at a lifestyle and a values level. Um, one of the big shifts that you see happening in the marketplaces today is customers simply demand more. And uh, they want to feel uh, a part of the journey of their service providers. Um, they're making ethical decisions in marketplaces. So one way companies uh, reignite growth with customers is leaning into, you know, ratcheting up their customer empathy, which means uh, rather than just fulfilling orders, it means leaning into how those products and services are being used by their customers and building supporting solutions or additional products to address their uh, needs. 
Now, of course, when you make your, ser- your, your service more valuable, um, then you create customer loyalty. Very practical example. Ten years of consulting, I was on the road every Monday morning. I had to catch a 7 a.m. flight to fly to Amsterdam or, or uh, Denmark to Copenhagen. And uh, I couldn't have done it without uh, my supporting staff. Um, I had a taxi driver who picked me up. And um, although I paid him, you know, eight euros every Monday and every Friday, he was an integral part of my ability to deliver uh, and, and, and deliver my, my value to my clients. Um, the same goes for the person who cleaned the house. Um, I knew I could count on her to show up uh, every Monday and every f- Friday. She would say, I, I bought milk, it's in the refrigerator, and I would say, my God, I love you. You are so essential. So she created more value to me. And uh, that's another way to grow your business is to create more value for your customers. And ultimately, the deeper your connections, the more loyalty, the longer the customer lifetime, and uh, the less you have to focus on building new clients, just uh, growing with your existing client base. Now, customer experience, uh, and specifically the topic of customer journey. Maybe you've heard this term or you've read articles about it, but I wonder how many small businesses have actually stepped back, taken a moment, and said, what is the customer journey for our target market? A customer journey starts with them becoming aware of your service. So obviously your marketing, your advertising, if the messages resonate with them, then they walk in the door, they come to your website. What the engagement of that customer looks like from awareness to starting with a product or service to getting their service if something goes wrong all the way through to ending the contract. I spent 10 years in consulting working for big companies literally looking at where are the promoters and the distractors uh, across the entire customer journey? A promoter is a, is a customer who says, I love this company and I'm willing to promote it to my friends and family. A detractor, uh, detractor, not a distractor, a detractor is someone who says, I'm really upset with this. And if someone says, do you like Vodafone Czech Republic? I will say, definitely you do not want to to go to those. Detractors harm your brand in the marketplace and promoters help accelerate your marketing efforts. And I'm wondering how many small businesses employ net promoter score as a technique to measure essentially customer satisfaction. It's a kind of an updated version of a customer satisfaction survey. Measuring net promoter score at the various transactions in the customer experience or the customer journey is a way that even small businesses can get a better idea on how to create delighted customers and eliminate the detractors and therefore grow their businesses. Now, who was it? Uh, Software eats the world. Mark Andreessen, one of the great venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, says software eats the world. Well, entrepreneurs who think about their businesses as if it were software, they understand that scaling your business model um, changes dramatically when your, your product or service that you offer to the market moves from a feature, which is in the startup world is hardly investable, to a a, a compilation of features, which we call a product. A CRM system is a product. It's a, it's a piece of software that uh, has several different types of features. Then as we move from left to right to a platform type business model, a platform is where we have um, uh, engagement of different parties um, in different ways across a piece of software. The economic value of a platform is significantly higher than a feature and and significantly higher than a product. Platforms sometimes have the potential to evolve into marketplaces. When parties on the platform start transacting and the owner of that platform takes a share, then they become a marketplace. Amazon is is a great example of this. First, it was an e-commerce site for books. Later, they figured out we could actually be selling anything other than books. And they started expanding 
the product portfolio, and now we know that we can buy anything on Amazon. And not only that, Amazon had to build a huge cloud infrastructure to support the sale of all those products. And so today they offer Amazon Web Services, and they, they have such capacity in the cloud for commerce services that they're able to sell those services to other companies that need those similar uh, uh, capabilities. So rethinking your business from a scaling point of view, like a software company, is another way to look beyond the things that limit, uh, limit your, your, your ability to dream today. All right, let's get into some fun stories because um, although, sure, Silicon Valley provides us with great examples of innovation, but innovation has been happening for ages and it's been happening in my world and I'd like to share with you now some of those stories. Well, first of all, my, my dad, I remember when my dad was an engineer uh, and he went to law school when I was about I don't know, fifth grade, so I was, what, about 10 years old. My dad uh, finished with his law degree, and he started his own private practice. So um, I used to go with my dad on Saturdays to his office, and he would uh, do about two hours of work, and I would take a yellow legal pad, and I would sketch in the office and just kind of listen to what he was doing and watching. But I, I realized many years later that my father had approach to digitally transforming his private law practice way back in 1977. And he did it with a new tech technology called a dictaphone. Now, there's a problem when you have a business model, and I'm going to use my hands to uh, accentuate this visually, if you can see me as well as the slides. I'm holding my hands in a pyramid shape. Law firms, accountancies, consultancies, dentists' offices, these are people-based businesses. And their ability to grow and scale depends on the ability of the management to build bigger pyramids. You want to grow your consultancy, your accountancy, your law firm, you hire junior lawyers, you train them up, they become senior lawyers, they hire out at, at higher rates, and you hire more juniors. Well, those business models, they only scale as easily as the management team is willing to manage the people. And big people pyramids not only get heavy, but also your margins are going to be relatively capped because you still have the high overheads of salaries. So here's my dad. Uh, he's a one-man show. Uh, sure, he can work 60 hours a week, but he has four kids. He needs to spend some time with the family. So what does he do? He buys a dictaphone that has uh, little tapes. He takes me on Saturdays. He sits down at his desk, puts his heels up on the desk, and he speaks into the microphone letters that he's writing to the courts and to the opposing attorneys. And he records this on his dictaphone for about two hours. And then he puts the tapes on the desk of his secretary, and the secretary types those up into letters and posts them. So what my dad was doing was, he, I only have so many hours in the day, but I charge every letter I send, I charge minimum 30 minutes of my time in my business model. But if he could narrate that in two to three minutes or five minutes by listening to what he's saying and really articulate the full letter and let the typist bang that out in just a few minutes and post it, he's scaling his business model. And he did that very well, and then he got hired into a big firm, and, and in his big firm, they had a whole battery of typists, and that's what every law, uh, lawyer was doing to scale their business model. All right, now I'm going to come straight home to Riga. Uh, here's an idea to grow your business. Put your business, uh, put your value proposition right into the daily routine of customers. For about two years, uh, every time I went to Riga, I stayed in an Airbnb at Brivibas 148. And just down the road, I at one point discovered a wonderful teeny tiny little cafe called Pippa. And I developed a friendly uh, relationship with Edwards, the owner uh, of, the, of the shop. Well, Edwards doesn't get a lot of traffic. And I remember one conversation we had. Um, I, I said, 
Edward, uh, how many coffees do you sell each day? And uh, he gave me his number and I said, would you like to grow that like by two or three times every, every day? And he said, sure. And I said, what are you doing today to do that? And he, he said, well, I'm advertising on Facebook and this and that. And I said, do you realize that right outside of your glass window on Brivibas, there's a bus stop. Uh, and that bus stop has traffic coming in and out of the city every single day. On the opposite side is, uh, what is the gaming company there? I forget the name of the gaming company. It's a big gaming company right across the street. I said, Edwards, just put a sign out front and say, your morning, uh, your morning commute coffee. And make it simple and easy for people to drop a couple of coins in, take a filtered coffee, or step inside and get a get a uh, one of your delicious espressos. And uh, we went through the numbers, and it was very feasible for this guy to improve his uh, number of sales two or three times every single day, and that was a significant impact uh, potential on revenues. Anyway. If you ever are at Brivibus 166, step into Pippa Cafe. Delicious coffee. Okay, coming back to the uh, reinventing your service model across the full customer journey. I could give an entire 90-minute lecture on all the learnings I had from the project with Telnor in Denmark. Uh, this was a company that for four, for four straight years, 16 quarters, they had been losing customers. And uh, the CEO was a 40 year old, first time CEO. He and I had worked together in Czech for, uh, in Prague for a, uh, uh, a challenger brand, third, uh, third mobile operator. And uh, we had good rapport. So he brought me in and he said, look, man, this, this business is gonna shut down if we don't turn it around. Uh, uh, he said, I want you to talk to everybody in the organization and, and talk with me and let's figure out a strategy on how we can right this ship. Well, we knew that service in Denmark was pretty limited. You know, family family is a big priority there. Uh, call centers close at four o'clock on Fridays. But when we looked at the level of service that was offered by all the competitors, what we realized is service had gotten so lean. Companies had stripped their business models down to optimize costs, to preserve margin, that they had really sacrificed the needs of customers. So we put together a, a strategy, we called it the storm turnaround. It was a brand repositioning. But most importantly, what we did is we looked at launching highly valuable services to customers from the time they were getting started with new smartphones all the way to how we treated them when they had an issue at the call center. And this strategy worked because um, it was a combination of every month we had planned the drop, we called it the, the lightning strike, of a new service that customers would love and value. And, and it, was a, it was a matter of launching a new service every month, not once, not twice, but it takes three experiences for the market to start to see a trend. And the whole point of the strategy was by re-engaging with customers' needs across the full life cycle, innovating new service concepts like helping people get started with a smartphone, transferring their contacts from one device to another, which you couldn't do that in 2013 so easily, especially if you're moving cross-platform Android to Apple. We had looked at the data in the channels. We knew that customers were suffering. And until this strategy, these had been acceptable uh, consequences of cost cutting. Well, he made a decision, we're going to make this different. Uh, we called out the competition in, in the marketplace saying, hey, competitors, you really also should launch 24-7 customer care um, and took the leadership role in service. The first quarter after the relaunch of the brand and the new services, we saw the first growth in five years. Needless to say, my buddy Marek did quite okay as his first time CEO and his career has been uh, super hot ever since. Okay, 20 years ago, when I moved to Prague with my then girlfriend, now wife, we used to go to restaurants and it was so difficult to find, frankly, decent food. Um, 
And we were not the only ones to see this. There was a guy named Tomasz Kogbyshek, who about the same time we moved here, he opened a steak restaurant in uh, the, uh, the one of the more prestigious neighborhoods in Prague. And here's his story. When the wall came down, this young guy went to Vienna and he experienced culinary culture. And then he came back to his, his home country and he recognized that Prague, this magnificent city with millions of tourists uh, forecast to come every year, simply was a wide open market when it came to high quality culinary experiences in restaurants. So this guy, Tomasz Karpiszek, saw that there was a completely unaddressed or underaddressed market gap. And what he did is he created a repeatable formula in terms of his restaurants. He created a company called Ambiante, which was the name of the first restaurant. Now it's Ambiante Group. This guy has launched 26 uh, companies in the last 20 years. He uh, essentially reinvented uh, the beef industry in the Czech Republic by investing and coaching uh, beef producers on how to provide high quality steak meat for his restaurants and for his clients. Uh, he was an innovator in the coffee industry, bringing high quality coffees in, having distribution rights. They call this guy, Tomasz Karpiszek, the Steve Jobs of restauranting in Prague. So this guy is an insatiable entrepreneur who still to this day is innovating in the restauranting space. All right, another story that's very close to home. 20 years ago, moving to Prague, my wife took a job with a small uh, freight forwarding company owned by an Irish guy named Maurice Ward. He was a very small freight forwarding company, but he had a vision. He knew which way the wind was blowing in terms of uh, manufacturing of TVs and computers in Central East Europe. He had seen it happen in his home country of Ireland, and in, in, he moved in the late 90s to Prague got a fax machine, started a freight forwarding company, started organizing deals. Well, when companies like Panasonic announced that they were moving to the Czech Republic, he positioned himself as a very small business, um, very closely as a trusted partner for those big brands coming to Czech. And what he did is he leveraged data and information around the logistics uh, uh, supply chain to create an extremely deep connection with these huge companies, and they pulled him into success. So what Maurice did that was amazing was he recognized that a company like Panasonic would be bringing components, parts, from Asian mar markets and other global markets into the Czech Republic. They would need customs clearance. They would need bonded warehouses. So again, this guy was just he had a vision, he knew what their needs were, and he provided all the solutions necessary to streamline these processes, which uh, he knew that these big companies hadn't fully anticipated. Now, his killer play was creating a, um, creating a uh, um, deep integration with the client's uh, SAP systems with his own homegrown piece of software. Now, the funny thing here is uh, my then girlfriend, wh whom I met in uh, business school, by the way, she was in the class uh, uh, that I told you about earlier. So uh, we shared a passion for, for business. Uh, he asked her, he said, well, you're the expert on customs clearance. I want you to provide the, the requirements for our IT solution. And my wife comes to me and says, well, let's see, you build software. I know what the process is. How do we communicate this so somebody can build the solution? They built this homegrown solution, and uh, that was it. Maurice was locked with Panasonic. Maurice grew from a couple million in revenue in the early 2000s, and I know for a fact he did 100 million in turnover in 2008, and he's done extremely well since then. Amazing story. Never took a bank loan. All privately funded. Okay, small businesses just like startups. You can build not just a solution. But start a revolution. Here's a story about my buddy Joao. He's a Portuguese guy. He's married to a Czech woman here in Prague. And uh, Joao graduated from a, a, an international university program here in Prague. 
And when he graduated, he started an IT recruitment company. And it worked for about two or three years. If anybody knows IT recruitment, you know how this works. A uh, company needs a Java developer or a Python developer. IT recruitment gives them a CV. If they like it, they hire the person. And recruiters get paid. In Czech Republic, it's three months of salary. So $1,500 a month is a really good salary for IT employee here in Prague. That's 4,500 euros fee for making a placement. So this is a highly lucrative business. But here's the dirty story. There's a game going on. The technical recruiters or recruiters in general, they play two sides of a story. They tell the companies, now I, I, I'm probably, if there are any recruitment agents on the call, you know, I'm, I'm just explaining that uh, that this is a very high fee uh, uh, transaction. And Joao recognized that the fee structure was so high, there's a lot of opportunity to bring that down if you can replace the need for human uh, recruitment agents in the process. As a CEO, he said, today I'm a pyramid business. Tomorrow, I'd like to be a software company. So he built a company called TechLoop. And TechLoop is a hiring platform. It's built on a very unique uh, insight, which is that technical resources um, if they just make a change on their LinkedIn profile, the next thing you know, they start getting inbounds from recruitment agents and they don't like that. So giving them the ability to look for a new job anonymously and then when the hire uh, transaction happens, TechLoop charges a lower fee to hiring companies and they take part of that fee and they give it to a bonus for the uh, hired employee all around the, the the message of congratulations, you took the risk, you should take part of the reward. And he's done very well uh, uh, in reinventing his business and in uh, in killing his old business model. Okay, here's another startup story, but it's a startup that had uh, innovated its, its business model uh, and it had become a small business that was self-sustaining and it was running okay but it hadn't grown and the principle here is if you can build something that solves your business problem then turn around and say hey if i've solved my problem who else has the same problem how can i sell the solution that i built for myself slack did this um, there's a great story about stuart butterfeld uh, he had exited from a startup. He was building a multi-user game uh, uh, business, which was not going anywhere. He went to his tech team. He said, hey, guys, uh, we're about out of cash. Is there anything we can you know, launch as a product? The tech team said, well, we're using this great chat application um, with emojis and team engagement. And, of course, that's the story of Slack. But more closer to home, this is one of the guys I met five years ago who has a company called Claimair. Claimair is a uh, flight insurance, um, uh, flight travel uh, claim solution. If your flight is delayed, uh, you have a legal right to file a legal petition and get paid for the delay, upwards of 250 euros for every flight. So if, you, if you're traveling with your family, you know, three or four people. This is a big uh, uh, liability that the airlines have, and they're legally obliged to pay it if it meets certain legal conditions. Well, Claimair's business was doing great when they first launched. They picked up a lot of business, and that, but they kind of reached a, a level of revenues where it stopped growing. One of the reasons was because there was a really big player in the space just down the road in Berlin. And uh, my buddy who's running this company came to me and he said, hey, man, how do we how do we jumpstart this business? Uh, because I, I can't really compete against this big player uh, over there in Berlin. So we started looking at his business model. And it turns out one of the pain points this guy had was every time you get a claim, you need to have eyeballs from a legal uh, authority from different jurisdictions depending on where the flight occurred in order to prosecute the claim with the airlines. So this guy was building his own network of uh, legal uh, partners across different markets. 
and he was trying to streamline the process to make it easier to manage that uh, that legal process because this was cost straight out of his pocket. So we looked at this and said, I wonder if the big player in Berlin has the same problem. So uh, lo and behold, uh, my buddy contacted the CEO of uh, of his big competitor. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, we're Claim Air. We're, we're just down the road in Prague, and uh, we're in the same business as you. Uh, and uh, we've, we're solving the problem now of prosecuting these these claims. Would you guys like to uh, meet for coffee? Well, guess what happened? The big player said, oh, my God, this is a huge pain for us, and we're looking for a solution. So they started talking, and, uh, and my buddy now is providing the legal services for his biggest competitor. So it's a great example of solving a problem for yourself and then turning around and selling it you know, to someone else. And in his case, and I think here's a principle for, for every company, um, is how to turn your competitors into your customers. You know, there's a revolutionary thought. And uh, the companies that I work with today, I oftentimes say that business development um, is the art of turning competition into cooperation. And I think uh, Claymare has done a very good job with that. It's, it's helped them grow significantly. Okay. Um, small businesses tend to look at their markets as the market that they serve. Um, perhaps there, the, there's a point of view where, um, they, uh, the small business is looking at opportunity in the, the, let's say, the closest arm's length. But real innovators look at problems that, saw, that are uh, extended across you know, global marketplaces. And I want to share with you one example. I'm, I'm not going to tell the name of the company because it's one of the SEB companies, uh, one, of the, one of the companies in the SEB growth program from Lithuania that I met last week. All right, so just to preserve their anonymity, this is a company that uh, uh, was interested in building an e-commerce platform for antiques. And although it was a, it was a, you know, a really compelling idea to launch an e-commerce site at a national level addressing the whole antique market, in conversations with this team last week uh, uh, in SEB, we had a conversation about what the real problem is with antique shops. And uh, we talked about this phenomenon called <clears throat> picking. In the U.S., there's a whole TV program called American Pickers, and it's all about people who chase antiques. They find these, you know, beautiful uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, they buy them cheap. They clean them up. They repair them, and they sell them to collectors or, or to others downstream and they're making a living doing this. Well, antiquing in Europe is amazing. When I moved to Prague 20 years ago, I was fascinated. I could go in my neighborhood and find six, seven antique shops and looking at statues from the old Soviet days. I mean, for an American, I'm looking at this stuff thinking, oh my God, this is history right here. And it's so cheap. Uh, and I'm thinking, gosh, my history professor back in the U.S. would love to have, you know, something that's a real artifact from this uh, wonderful history and culture. Um, and I saw that there was an arbitrage opportunity, but it's all analog. All the products in these antique shops are being uh, managed in a paper ledger or perhaps today in an Excel spreadsheet or maybe an access database if the team is really savvy. But these are still largely analog businesses and they're highly fragmented. And yet, if you look across all of the inventory, across all the fragmented network, what an amazing opportunity to digitize all of those assets, put them in a singular place so it's more easily searchable and findable. You take those, um, you take those needles in a haystack, those little gems, and they're suddenly visible by, you know, pickers in London or in Berlin or in San Francisco or in Maryville, Tennessee. Um, and the next thing you know, 
uh, you know, this is a real possibility to create kind of an Amazon environment for the antique industry. And this is the conversation I had with uh, with one of the founders uh, uh, of, the, of the SEB team last week. And uh, I asked him at the end of the session, how are you feeling? And he said, I'm in tears. This is this is what I want to do because this is impact. And uh, this is an important message, I think, for, for everybody on the webinar today is that uh, 10x growth, innovation, innovation for what purpose? This is about impact. You want to grow your company, have a bigger impact on your customers that you have today. Um, have a bigger impact on the industry that you are participating in. Solve a problem not at the company level or at the customer level, but at the systems level. This is the type of innovation that is, is happening in the world today. And that's why digital is the revolution, because people are trying to change the game, move the needle, you know, going for these moonshots. And yet all these principles are available to companies of every size. Okay, there is a process that uh, companies all use, and it's called the lean process to help facilitate innovation. And uh, I think it's important to share just a little bit of this with the audience today before I move on to the next topic. So when launching new products or services, in the startup world, we know that 42% fail. And uh, there's a, one reason why, because they, they really sometimes don't understand the customer's problems as well as perhaps they think they do, um, or maybe the market wasn't ready, um, or the competitors were too strong, or maybe just naivety about the way the world works. But I'm gonna make an argument today that many of the companies that try and innovate and fail is because they jump to they jump from idea to the thinking of product market fit before they get to the essential step before which is called customer and needs fit um, if you build a product you take it to market and the, the the customer says wow amazing cool solution but you know what i'm good i'm cool that, that's not for me that's a non-starter, and that's a recipe for fail. And I, I saw a CB Insights article last week. Around 70% of companies that are doing product innovation also fail. And a lot of that comes back to lack of customer needs fit. And that's one of the reasons why the lean process uh, espouses this build, measure, lean philosophy. It says that before you build your product and push it to market, Build a concept, test it with the market, measure the feedback, modify the idea, then build your MVP, launch it with minimum features, see how people use it. It's this cyclical uh, feedback loop system which significantly reduces expense and wasted expense and cost for innovation. So, you know. Innovation is not a one-shot exercise. It's an exercise of uh, deepening uh, and evolving and chipping away at an idea until you find one that really locks with the customers. In our industry, you hear the term MVP or mean viable product. That's a version of the product that has just enough features to satisfy your earliest customers so you can start getting qualitative and quantitative feedback to refine that product before you come out with your, your final build. Um, there's a really good mentor in the Baltics ecosystem named Cristo Maggi. He's an ex-Skype employee, founder of Dkit. And I've, I've met him at a few uh, accelerators. He's an exceptional, exceptional guy. I like his term. Instead of MVP, he calls it a minimum delightful product. And I rather, rather kind of like that because it shows real empathy with, uh, with the customers. So thinking of this build, measure, learn process as the analogy I like to use is you've got an idea. Um, and, and like Michelangelo had an idea about uh, the Venus de Milo. Um, 
he saw that beautiful statue inside this block of Venetian marble. So what does he do? He chips away, removes the noise, takes away all the unessentials, distills it down to its bare, beautiful uh, final product. So this build, measure, learn is a process of, of evolving until you see the customer smile. And when the customer smiles, that's usually a good indicator that it's time to scale up. Now, in this SEB process, this is the first public lecture, and today will be the first workshop with uh, 14 small businesses from uh, Latvia. And we're going to start the process of iterating using a concept called positioning. Now, if, if any of you uh, have seen my work in, in other markets, you'll know that positioning starts with a value proposition. And a value proposition is not a product. Um, I, I, I love this picture because this is Charles Revson, the founder of Revlon. He has this fantastic quote where he says, um, in our factory, we make lipstick, but in our advertising, we sell hope. The value proposition is what the product does to the customer and how it makes them feel. The product is uh, some kind of a waxy component in a deep red uh, color uh, coming in a metal tube with a plastic lid that looks elegant, but it makes someone feel amazing. And that's the difference between a product and a value proposition. Now, so value propositions need to be positioned in marketplaces. Well, so do brands. And uh, just to cover brand positioning, you know, if I were to ask, you know, if we were all together in a room and I would say Volvo, what does this brand stand for? I'm pretty sure somebody in the audience would raise their hand and say, that's a safe automobile. And you'd be exactly right, because Volvo as a brand positions itself for drivers who put a high value on their personal safety or the safety of their families when they're on the road. And that's why they build a quality car brand and they put passenger safety above all else. They were early innovators in seat belts, early innovators in roll bars. And to this day, it's one of the safest cars you can drive on the road. And we still perceive it that way. Patagonia is another wonderful story, a brand that uh, is ideal for enthusiasts who feel connected with nature and they want to be part of the solution rather than the problem of pollution and climate change. So they produce their... Um, uh, responsible, they, they, were, they produce their outdoor apparel and sportswear and gear in a way that's environmentally responsible. They even have a sustainability fund. It's just a great, great brand. I, I love Patagonia. And Harley Davidson, for the people who know, Harley is a brand, it's a lifestyle, it's about being part of a, almost a cult. And their product, although it is a motorcycle, the value proposition is that feeling of free spiritedness and being part of that exclusive community. Well, companies, whether they're launching products or launching new brands, a good place to start is with a positioning statement. This is a, a framework that's been used by advertising agencies for 40, 50 years, and it is a short clear description of how a product or a value proposition, whether it's a, a built already or just at a conceptual level, satisfies a consumer or a business need better than the competition. And this is an exercise we're going we're gonna to work with the teams with today after our public, uh, our public uh, discussion. So a positioning statement pulls from another lean tool, which is called a business model canvas. Um, if you've ever done this in, in an innovation program or, or seen this online, you know, if you've got a, a thought about how to grow your business, print this out on a big format with your team, take it into your, your, your boardroom or on a big table with some post-it notes and say, okay, team, let's solve customers' problems. Where are they struggling? Write your ideas on post-it notes. There are no bad ideas. Stick them on the problem brainstorm solutions, um, identify how you will measure the improvement in their situation when they use that solution. You can see how this product process unfolds on this thing called a business model canvas. 
Well, for positioning, we skip over the canvas itself and pull a selected number of pieces and we put it into something that I call a positioning statement. Okay, I'm going to get to that just in a moment, but I want to walk through how I see the world when it comes to nailing the positioning. You know, positioning is kind of this ethereal discussion because it's very sort of nebulous, kind of hard to understand for, for some folks. And what I want to do here is paint a broad strokes picture about how to get from and the context of a customer all the way down to a product market fit. And the way I see the world is it's a sequence of unfoldings from customer context to the definition of the tight customer, first users, understanding of their needs, building solutions, um, having a concept on how that fits in a marketplace. And when all those things come together, you're, you're in a good way. But it starts, first of all, by understanding your customer's context and the customer's needs. Because customers uh, in a marketplace, uh, if they don't have the need, they're going to say, great product, but it's not for me. I don't need it. Some companies succeed very well by, by reframing a problem that maybe a customer doesn't know that they have. Um, in a way that it becomes a priority problem. That's uh, very good with, um, with startups. Um, but a problem has to make somebody's life better. And in the, in the startup world, we always say it's got to move somebody's needle. It needs to be impactful, a game changer for them. If it's a game changer, then they're more likely to adopt it. And it starts with customer needs fit. Once the customer and their needs are understood, building a solution that directly addresses those needs, starting with an MVP and iterating, is a great way to, to achieve the second key step, which is the needs solution fit. Once the needs solution fit, the, the MVP goes into the market, you start to assess whether there's a solution and market fit. Now notice I have these exclamation points at each of these three steps. Um, I, I highlight this here because if there's error in understanding customer needs and then a solution is developed, the error translates then into the solution. And if the solution is built in a way that doesn't have compatibility with market, then the compounding of those errors really makes product market fit difficult. But if you do it right, you reach this magical uh, place called product market fit and if it fits with the customer's world, ah, I see a spelling error myself, I'll get that, then you've got positioning. Okay, I hope you're with me. I'm just going to take an eyeball, look at the clock. All right, we're doing great. So positioning, it always starts with customer. It starts with empathy and it starts with understanding the customer's, what I call context. It's the customer's world. In, in customer experience and customer journey work that I've done over my, my career, um, there's a phrase that always comes back to me, and that is, wear the shoes of your customer or the, wearing the skin of your customer. Um, you want to build a great innovative product that's going to be a game changer for your business and be, be great for, for your, your customers. Be able to tell a story that they identify with that shows you have deep understanding of where their struggles, where their ambitions, um, where their um, dreams are in terms of accomplishing their life's or business goals, if you're B2, B2C or B2B. And then you set your direction on how to best serve those, those needs. It's this first step that creates a tremendous amount of power uh, behind your story um, uh, and meaning uh, for your team. Um, come on, if you're bringing your team together saying, okay, let's build the next product that's going to increase revenues by a million a year, you know, does that motivate your team as much as, hey, um, teachers are right now suffering on how to pull together curriculums and engage students in an online environment, and students are suffering because they're, they're not getting the quality education how can we solve this problem and make everybody's life significantly easier? I mean, literally, right now, 
there must be hundreds, if not thousands of people trying to wear the skin of those teachers and those students and those concerned parents and building solutions that are extremely meaningful for the education of those young folks, given this you know, really disruptive change in context, which we're all, all dealing with. Incidentally, as of today, my son is working as schooling from home because we had, uh, I don't know, about 8,000 cases yesterday. We went from hero to zero in Czech Republic. There's another conversation for another day. But, you know, the winds of change and, and the life context of customers create tremendous meaning in the innovation process. Everything takes place within that context. And what we look for in the innovation uh, process is a concentric overlapping of the customer and the needs. So, you know, this is a tough question for some teams in, uh, in our exercises, and I fully expect this the afternoon. So for the teams who are, we're going to be meeting with later, uh, you know, be ready because I'm going to ask you, who do you want to serve? Who is the segment that you are so passionate about that you understand uh, you understand their life, their life situations, so that you can build something uh, that addresses what I call the relevant and highly valuable and unmet needs that they have. Uh, in, in the startup game, we, we talk about there are startup problems and there are real problems. Um, startup problems oftentimes are uh, they're very simplified stories which fail to address the nuances in the real life of, of the customer. Classic example here is uh, I was accelerating a startup team in November of 2016 in Riga as part of an accelerator program. And I met this guy and uh, we ended up doing some work together and putting his pitch deck together and fundraising. We thought he was going to be a game changer for industry because he had a little clip on that could measure body movements and it could predict body movements that would cause back injuries and neck injuries for industrial workers. So the whole story was about solving the industry problem of musculoskeletal injuries. And although we were not incorrect, what we failed to understand is who is he actually going to sell this to and who is going to buy it and why? And uh, it, it took about a year and a half before the CEO figured out that although I am a B2B product, I'm a business selling my product to industry, it's really almost like I'm selling it to a consumer, which was the head of health and safety. Fantastic short story here is if you've ever worked in industry, I don't know, maybe you've worked in a warehouse, um, I don't know, have you been a logger? Wood, wood industry is big in, in Latvia. Uh, the person who's responsible for health and safety is not the favorite person on the team. Uh, when the health and safety guys come around with their clipboards and say, lift with your legs, not your back, you know, people are like, ah, Joe, go on. They're learning health and safety in classrooms. They're learning it um, in uh, lectures. There are posters on the wall, reminders, probably in emails that are sent out. Very ineffective uh, in terms of efficacy. Well, Matthew building an app with a really great coaching experience and his little clip on, when he started showing this to health and safety managers, they loved it. Why? They loved it because it was fun. It was visual. It was engaging. And if they go to their employees and say, ladies and gentlemen, no more classrooms. Just wear this thing. Download the app. And when your body moves, you'll feel your phone buzz and take a look. People are like, really? Well, guess what happens? Matthew figures out Soda Analytics is not solving the musculoskeletal injury uh, problem for industry, he's solving the problem that health and safety just simply ain't fun. And he completely re-engineers his value proposition around making it fun and engaging for employees. So his value proposition now is he helps companies build a culture of safety in a way that's fun and engaging for everybody. 
I mean, I, if you're hearing this story, that is the difference between looking at customers and understanding needs. He found the group and, and they were the zero and he turned them into hero. And he moved the needle and he's doing great. He's raising a series A and uh, I, I think his investors got to be very happy with the progress he's making. One technique which is in the innovation space, been around for a few years, is a topic called jobs to be done. Um, when I was putting this uh, workshop together for all of you, um, this this came to mind because I, I believe in the second workshop, uh, one of your great mentors in the SEB program is going to talk about customers, personas, and jobs to be done. And I wanted to introduce it. So there's a nice segue to her public lecture and, uh, and the work she's going to do with teams. And it's really got me thinking. I am now having conversations with my, my wife and my son about jobs to be done around the household because we're kind of stuck inside. And I think about, you know, keeping the floors clean is a jobs to be done. Yeah, Mr. Green, Mr. Clean. I am this close to committing the CapEx to invest in one of those robotic floor cleaners because that job to be done can save me 30, 40 minutes a day. I like a clean house. That's why I'm the cleaner. But these jobs to be done are the things that a customer has to do through their regular uh, job. If they're a consumer, it's, you know, it's me and sweeping the floors, cleaning the floors. If it's a business person, they have lots of jobs to be done. And by itemizing those jobs to be done and then having conversations with your customers about where are the struggles across your jobs to be done, that is a great canvas for identifying opportunities for solution building. Naturally, you've got your context. You've got this concentric overlap between needs and customers and needs. Now it's time to slide a solution on top of there to address those unmet needs where the outcomes, benefits, and impacts are quantitative, visible, measurable, moving the needle, and they make the customer feel great. Easier said than done, but I, I hope now that you start to see how all this pieces together. You do it right and bingo, you get problem solution solution market fit. Okay. Still one more step. We've got to take that solution and stuff it into a marketplace. Well, here's the thing. Fintech companies, maybe you've heard about this, fintechs. These are the new banks, the digital banks, the new payment solution providers. They're trying to disrupt finance and banking. Um, and, you know, what is the what is the role that they're playing? They're stirring up the pot. So the big players have to figure out ways of working with these innovative startups in a way that uh, works for everyone. So you still need to get your value proposition into the marketplace and not get crushed by the competition. So being able to fit within that ecosystem, add value to those partners rather than trying to just steal market share is one way to go. And ultimately, customers do have many, many choices. So uh, it's you got to have some differentiability to really stand out. A great story is a good way to do that. Then you start to get that early traction and the business starts to take off. All right. We are really close. Bear with me. We are now uh, looking at what is called the positioning statement template. Um, now, anybody who's out there watching this and you have a business idea in your head, take a screen capture uh, right now and park that and come back to it. Um, and I'm going to show you an example also in a bit so you can, you can get a feel for what a uh, positioning statement looks like. This is a great place to piece it all together so you can sort of conceptually see what your idea is, who it's for, why they need it, what it does and how it's going to fit into the marketplace and ultimately what impact it's going to have on, on customers. This is the framework we're going to use with Teams and SEB 
to start shaping uh, their ideas, their growth growth ideas. Um, and this is, uh, again, it's a framework that's been around for many years. I'm modifying it. Actually, this is the first time I'm using it in public because I'm going to test it with some of the teams that I work with and see if it maybe is a little bit easier to help us get started on the innovation journey. Okay, so uh, show, don't tell. Uh, I would like to provide you now with a case study of a small business innovation, and it's very, very close to home. Um, here's, here's the part of today where I really miss not being able to see all your beautiful smiling faces, uh, because it would be just great to be in a room and ask all of you to say, please raise your hand if, if you've ever eaten uh, walkie-talkie. There are three locations in Riga, and this is a small business. Um, by a guy that I met in an accelerator program because he had a big idea. And I'd like to share that with you. So, Giannis, if you're listening, shout out. You're amazing. Um, Giannis Poruks, who is the owner of Walkie Talkie. By the way, a little free advertising, Giannis. I know you're still trying to grow your startup. Hopefully your revenues will go up. Sorry, shameless plug. Um, Giannis is a great guy, Giannis Porux. Uh, he started a company uh, that he calls Robo Eats, and I mentored him in the Build It Hardware Accelerator on Elizabeth Iela, right across from uh, Berg's Bazaars, which is a great outfit. I'm going to tell you the story of Robo Eats. So, and Giannis, you can, you know, you can call me later and say you got it wrong, but I'm going to tell your story. Forgive me if I don't get it just right. I do like storytelling. He knows that. Um, anyway, Giannis's context is that uh, it's difficult to hire people. Um, you know, when you have three restaurants and uh, you're feeding hungry people, if somebody doesn't show up for work, that's a problem. Um, if somebody gets sick, you know, the human condition sometimes intervenes and disrupts businesses. Um, being able to deliver you know, produce the food, cook the food, and get it out to customers. Uh, he saw that as a challenge, and he started thinking, you know, robots. How could we build? How could I build a solution that would solve the problem of labor to help me streamline my business and grow? And that's the context within which he started defining really a game changer for himself as an entrepreneur and potentially for his own businesses. Here we go. So, Giannis, just FYI, we, you can get a copy of this later. We did not do this when we mentored two years ago, but uh, happy to have another conversation with you. I pulled Giannis's stuff into this, what I call positioning canvas. Uh, and I wanted to understand for myself, where is Giannis going with his current situation? What's his general big idea? Who are those target customers he's going to go after that are beyond his own business? What is the direct problem or set of problems that he's trying to address? Um, what is his vision, number five, vision for a better world? And then uh, how do you describe that simply and clearly? Because you need to communicate this down the line to future investors and, and other partners. Um, and then describing very simply what it does which sometimes is the hardest part of this endeavor, is to say, what exactly do you do to make somebody's life better? And uh, I, I saw Giannis's uh, profile on LinkedIn and his profile on Crunchbase, which is where all companies you know, in the innovative space need to have profiles so you get found by investors. These are his words about what the outputs or benefits. I was so inspired by this, Giannis, that I, I embraced this. Uh, but here's something new for you, buddy. I think you're in a new category. You're in a category called precision fast food. And at an analogy level or metaphoric level, dude, you're building big vending machines that serve up hot meals. And that's awesome. Okay, so let's bring this together now in a positioning statement. So predominantly, we're talking about fast food restaurants, maybe even cafeterias that are facing problems with high labor costs, staff shortages, uh, quality issues, COVID issues. Along comes RoboEats. 
What is it? It's a robotic, fully automated food system that cooks and serves hot custom meals without human help. RoboEats replaces a bunch of people. It operates 24 seven and never complains. And it provides a wide variety of dishes, saves businesses a lot of money. By the way, I think the margins are gonna be pretty, pretty sweet on this as well. And um, with RoboEats, food prep companies produce high quality, ready to eat in minutes with no labor hassles. This is perf welcome to precision fast food. We're, we serve meals, we're robots. Now, there are a bunch of different ways that Giannis could look at Robo Eats. And the context of solving uh, the labor issue for, for restaurants and, and, and for uh, uh, fast food is one. But I'm going to just throw out another idea here. You know, there are some huge challenges coming down the pipeline that we're all, they're going to touch everybody. They're going to touch everybody every day. Uh, many of them will be driven by changes in our climate, uh, changes in our food system related to the climate change, changes in the way people move to find stability in a planet where there are areas that are very hot, there's no food and no water. I know it's 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 a really down a down conversation to talk about climate change, but uh, it's the it's the big gorilla in the room, and we can't ignore it. So any companies who are moving forward right now in the next ten years, it will look dramatically different than the ten years uh, preceding. And the hopes and dreams that we had ten years ago, and the hopes and dreams we have today, are much more sober. So solution providers like Giannis can look at Robo Eats as you know, a way to feed people who are on the move, perhaps due to climate change or other reasons, efficiently and at scale. Um, he could also look at it as the future of hot meals in rapidly urbanizing cities, which is a trend which has been happening for ages and it's only going to accelerate. More and more people will come to cities. They will live in smaller spaces. They will spend more time eating meals out because their kitchens are smaller. And being able to get a hot, healthy, freshly made meal in four minutes for a reasonable price um, is a pretty amazing value proposition. And this is why Robo Eats gets really interesting. And Giannis, you're inspiring a whole generation, hopefully, of entrepreneurs there in Riga to uh, solve global problems and uh, really take risk and dream big, bigger. By the way, this is what it looks like. Um, it's pretty cool. He's got a partnership with uh, a big robotics provider, but you can see the shelves on our right in the image. Those shelves, some of them, I suppose, are refrigerated. Some of them are boiling water. Some of them contain dry goods like pastas and rice. That little silver dish on the left-hand side is where the cooking takes place. It's a rotating cylinder. And that uh, robot grabs stuff from our right, moves it to our left, pops it in there, that thing cooks it up, and then the, the robot grabs a little paper dish, puts the, pours the food in it, gets poured into it, then it sprays on top of it all the condiments, and then it puts it in a window and serves that directly to the customer. Now, I want you to imagine, you pop your credit card in there, you select the hot Robo Eats meal, four minutes later, it's piping hot in a dish, Let's go one step further. That dish is not made of plastic or unrecyclables or even compostable material. It's a fully reusable dish and you sh shift it into a slot in the side of this nine by nine or three by three uh, box and it automatically gets uh, perfectly washed for the next meal and it has almost no footprint on the, uh, on the environment. Okay, I'm going to skip over Soder. I, I kind of told that story a moment ago. Here we are. We're at kind of the end of today. I've sort of, you know, given you the fire hose uh, drowning in uh, ideas and uh, stories and uh, hopefully, you know, lighting some fires in some folks who are, who are watching this call. The way we grow is we find new sources of growth. Yeah, for any business. And the way you do that is by looking beyond your borders, by peeling back the layers of the problem solving and looking at the systems problems rather than just the customer's problems. Um, you've seen that 
innovation happens at the coffee shop level. It happens at the legal firm level. Um, it, it happens in the restauranting industry. It happens across all industries. Um, that there is a process. It's called the lean process. It's a great way to start uh, this discussion. If you're a hotel and you're thinking out of the box, if you're a real estate management company, lean process is a great place to start. And then, of course, using the positioning tool as a means to get tighter on your idea so you can go out and share it with potential customers and say, hey, what do you think? Get their feedback at concept level. Then you start building your first MVP. Hopefully that's you know kind of what you, you take away from today. Internet memes, aren't they great? So this is this is what it looks like. Um, this journey is it's call it the unfolding of your better self. And we all know that when we want to be our better selves, a better parent, a better husband, a better friend, a better business person, a better service provider, it's not always a linear process. It's a, it's a messy process. But when you embrace the lean lean methodology and positioning, uh, can straighten out some of those kinks. And we're going to do that today, today and this week. So starting today, we're going to try and nail the positioning of the idea to make things easier for these 14 lucky teams. Um, before I go to Q&A, because I'm just at the very end, I want to say one thing. A uh, big thank you to Savita and to SEB, the bank, because it's the efforts that you put in and the commitment that your leadership puts into these programs that brings to me a Christmas day. There's nothing I love more than looking under the Christmas tree and seeing a bunch of gifts that need to be unpacked. And to me, I have 14 Christmas gifts. I get to unpack. I get to take the bow off. I get to open the paper, lift the box, and look inside and say, what do you do? Pitch me. And all you teams out there, you're going to pitch me, and I'm going to say, oh, my God, you are so beautiful. There's so much opportunity. You could do this. You could do that. Oh, which one do you want to do? And you are you are a beautiful toy for me to play with. And uh, so big thanks to the program for, for giving me this opportunity. Hey, everybody. It is my wish that you imagine your way to new possibilities. And when you're ready to pitch like a rock star, that you link with me on LinkedIn and you say, I need help. And through one of my partners or with myself, we can do this together and we can all make the world a better, more interesting, uh, more equitable and more sustainable place for everybody. Namaste. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, I understand there's some questions, so I'm going to stop sharing and go to. Yeah, stop sharing and go to Q&A. Because I believe Zana has given me some questions and we got a few minutes. Aha, okay. Okay, I'm going to go with the agricultural sector question. Um, the question is uh, Are there any, ex do I have any experience or are there experiences in marketing with the agricultural sector? Well, let me just say that one of the biggest areas right now in innovation is how to feed 10 billion people by 2050. Um, and that is a fully loaded uh, problem that we all share. It's a humanities problem. So who's your target market? Humanity. We all got to feed everybody by 2050. No one goes hungry. Everyone gets the calories and we all still get to eat steak and bacon. Yeah. We're not going to sacrifice quality and we're not going to pay premiums. Everything has to be at price parity or lower. You know why? Because we can do it. But we have to innovate in the ag sector. So, um, again, very quickly, sustainability, ESG, uh, environmental sustainability and governance is the new topic for innovation and investment all around the world. The European Union is putting uh, somewhere around one T, one trillion euros into combating uh, global climate change. And the United Nations has their sustainability development goals, the SDGs, 
Um, you know, if you're interested in making the world a better place, then check out the UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Investors are starting to queue up around those goals and around the topic of, you know, pulling humanity back from the brink of disaster with its carbon nightmare and repairing Mother Nature to her fully operational and healthy self. Uh, we've got a role to play there in getting back to parity and balance with nature. Agriculture is going to be hot. Uh, I met with a team not too long ago that is um, eliminating the need for pesticides by using robots that roam around fields and shoot uh, weeds with lasers. Um, I have worked with teams from Lebanon who are using IoT and camera and visual technology to um, uh, literally keep an eye on crops and identify infestation so that uh, intervention with pesticides instead of happening at uh, spray cropping level, which is just horrible for mother nature, it can be more targeted. Um, there are incredible things happening in uh, vertical farming. Infarm is a billion dollar valuation company out of uh, Berlin that is putting vertical farms to grow food in grocery stores. Rimi, if you're on the call, Maxima, you need to be talking to Infarm. Um, so tons of activity in agriculture uh, and lots of problems to be solved there. Next question, are there any places around the world that have better preconditions for startups? Um, <laughs> you guys don't get it, maybe. The Baltics is the place to be. It's amazing. I, I'm an American. I've, I've spent time in Silicon Valley. Uh, you have an amazing ecosystem just around you. Riga, Vilnius, Kaunas, Tartu, Tallinn, Helsinki. And uh, you're, you're, the innovation that's happening at university and startup level and even at uh, corporate level. I mean, I think one of the biggest uh, forest management companies in, in Riga, in Latvia, is using drone technologies and uh, machine learning to better manage forests. So uh, you are in, you know, in my point of view, one of the best places you could possibly be to build global solutions is right there in the Baltics. Any other uh, questions? Do I need to scroll up? Um, I'm just going to check. Not much time left. We have two minutes. So Zane, did you want to come in and say a few minutes? Um, and before I say goodbye, uh, um, Thanks to everybody who showed up early this morning and uh, and stayed with me through the whole lecture. Um, and hey, let's let's be good to each other and let's be good to the world. And uh, I hope to see some of you, all of you, any of you in Riga. We'll go to Cadets de Gascon and have a delicious chocolate thingy and a coffee when I get there. Okay, we got one more question I hear is coming in. You want to just push that to the chat? Irena, one more cue. Yes, no, maybe. Zane, hi. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> so there, maybe we can answer to one more of the questions that we had. And the question was, hi Wallace, in build, measure, learn loop, exactly what and how needs to be measured? Quite extensive question, but still maybe. No, no, it's a good question. It's a great question. Look, um, first of all, whenever you build something, we need to know if the user achieved their goal. So I, I, there was a team I worked with recently who has a T-shirt that has uh, actuators in it, and it's for people who are hearing impaired. And in the hearing impaired therapy process, they're learning to uh, connect with music and, ver and words. And I, I said to this young lady um, who's at, uh, she's at Riga Tech, RTU, uh, building this solution, I said, does it work? And what goals does a, a voice therapist have for their patients? She needs to understand what are the KPIs and how does that therapist measure the outcomes of those um, jobs to be done? And it's those KPIs which then the innovator embraces and says, we must measure efficacy. Does it work? 
But beyond that, you have qualitative measurements like how does it make the patient feel? Did they enjoy it? Um, net promoter score is a, is a very simple one. You can ask someone who's used your MVP, how likely would you be to recommend this solution to others? And if they say, oh my God, it was amazing, I give a 10, probably you're onto something. But if they give you a seven or a six or lower, then maybe you're not moving the needle. And that's good feedback to go back and say, where did I miss it? How can I refine it? Thank you for that question. That's a good one. Yeah, and then we have very one very, very last one. How to actually test this MVP? Just launch it in the market as it is and wait for feedback no, or no, no. try to find specific customer group and give it for free? Second one, friends and family. Give it to a friendly account. I mean, really, if you're early, early stage, give it to a customer and say, does this help you? And if they say, yeah, this is, this is pretty good, um, but I wish it would do this, that, and the other, you know, you listen, you refine, and then once it becomes really a product, then you start pushing it out to market. You cannot wait in this game. This is a game of go get it. It's not a game of, you know, if you build it, they will come. Very good question, and I, I hope everyone hears that. Uh, you got to go, you know, convince people to try it. Exactly. Okay, Wallace, uh, thank you for giving a very inspirational speech today with a lot of practical examples. We're going to see you in 15 minutes together with those 14 companies. And paldies visiem, ka šodien pieslēdz esmu tiešraidē. Droši dodieties arī uz menti.com, lai novērtētu šodienas lekciju. Un tie, ka mēs jau pēc divām nedēļām nākamajā lekcijā un sekojiet līdzi sev Facebook lapā par tuvākajām aktualitātēm, kas saistīts ar izaugsmas programmu. Paldies! Paldies!